Um, I wanted to uh, welcome everyone. I know you've had a, a long day of uh, sessions together, and I'm honored to be with you. Uh, as that warm welcome indicated, I am the president of the National Remodeling Foundation and the Center for Kitchen and Bath Education and Research. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have represented several Turkish brands in their North American launches. So um, I feel close to home with all of you. I'm going to speak slowly today so that your interpreter, Mr. Aaron, can uh, keep up. So let's get started. As, as uh, you had heard, um, we're excited to share the insights, research, and experiences designed to help your sales and marketing teams become more aligned. And just so you know, this uh, webinar was recently approved for continuing education credits in the United States by the American Institute of Architects, as well as the International Design Continuing Education Council. Today, I'm going to help you understand how aligning your sales and marketing efforts can generate a more effective go-to-market strategy and ultimately drive an increased bottom line. During the presentation, we'll cover how to identify sales and marketing misalignment, how to build sales and marketing teams that work together, and crucially, how to maintain that sales and marketing alignment once you have established it. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have some time for questions, so I'm looking forward to engaging with you then. Step one, as they often say, is to recognize the problem to identify sales and marketing misalignment. And the way that we uh, experience that most frequently is missed sales targets. And when we're not, uh, when our clients and prospects are not meeting their sales targets, the first question they have is why not? And what can we do about it? Most businesses sales and marketing teams work in different silos and they're cordoned off from each other and they don't always see eye to eye. And this leads to finger pointing. Marketing says about sales most often is, sales never follows up on the leads that we provide to them. Sales wants to participate at industry events and trade shows, but we're worried that they're going to go off script. They're going to create messaging that doesn't resonate with the marketing messaging that we have already created and are featuring this year. And they're most worried that sales has no idea what kind of campaigns that marketing is running. So on the other hand, literally, when the finger points in the opposite direction, sales thinks about marketing, that marketing has no idea what goes on in the real world. The sales folks are the ones that are in the trenches, so to speak, hand-to-hand -hand combat in real-world scenarios, and they think marketing lives in an idealistic place. They also believe that marketing is a cost to the organization. And they claim that sales is really the res revenue driver. And they're concerned that the leads that marketing produces aren't really qualified. So let's talk about some metrics and some stats related to sales and marketing alignment. It's said that 60% of the sales pipeline is stuck with no decision pending. Think about that, 60% is stuck. And only 25% of sales leads and the marketing collateral and brochures that the team creates is actually used by the sales force. 30% of sales reps claim to spend 20 to 50% of their valuable selling time looking for, creating, and modifying the marketing materials that they are supposed to be using. And less than 35% of a sales rep time is actually spent on selling. That means that the other 65% isn't accountable towards the best efforts and best use of their time. 
close to 75%, close to 78% of newly hired sales reps take six months or longer to become fully proficient at selling. That's a long runway and not very efficient. But when they work together, sales and marketing teams can create and execute campaigns that are better targeted, more effective, and have more tangible success metrics. When sales and marketing is closely aligned, companies are 67% better at closing deals and enjoy 35% higher customer retention. So you might ask, what's the problem? This alignment only happens in about 8% of companies. That's not so impressive. There are often telltale signs that cross-team collaboration is going poorly when sales targets are being mixed. I wanna bring you to a story. When I started my career before I formed Kleber and Associates, I worked in the restaurant industry and I started in the kitchen as a chef and I ended up in a waiter and they called that the back of the house and the front of the house. The kitchen is the back of the house and, the, and where the customers sit at the table and interact with the waiter is called front of the house. And it gave me a unique opportunity to experience both of those two sides. So you could imagine what would happen when a waiter comes to the kitchen and says, the customer wants a little less of this and a little more of that. And typically the chef didn't appreciate the waiter meddling in his business. And so what we recommend in sales and marketing alignment is the same opportunity that experienced in restaurants, which is coming together so that the front of the house and the back of the house have a better understanding about how to deliver a customer experience. And in the case of the corporate world, manufacturers of building products, we recommend regular meetings, whether they be in-person or virtual, that's critical to keeping teams aligned and making sure that the communication flows back and forth. Otherwise, you risk team members becoming disengaged and to quote one of my favorite Led Zeppelin songs, you set the stage for some communication breakdown. Can you imagine from our example of the restaurant world, if the waiter in the front of the house went one step further and took it upon himself or herself to carry their own spices and actually adjust the food on the way out to the table, the way that they thought it should be done. Or if the chef was so inflexible and resistant to compromise, because he or she were so confident that the patrons that were coming to the restaurants were coming to experience their creation exactly in the way that it was prepared. Instead, this visual is what I'd like us to focus in on, where teams are sharing the cuisine and they learn from each other those best practices. So how do we put these pieces together so that sales and marketing are aligned? And I use the word pieces because that's what makes for a jigsaw puzzle. You probably realize that during this last pandemic, people started first on Netflix and then they got bored with that and the sales of jigsaw puzzles skyrocketed. And the process to put together a jigsaw puzzle, as we all know, is to lay all the pieces out on the table and to put the colored side up and the gray backing of the paper down so that you can get a look at the different colors. And you lay out the pieces and start looking for the straight edges and the corners so you can begin to put it all together the way it was pictured on the outside of the box. The goal is to create order so that you can solve the puzzle. And if you think about it, sales and marketing alignment is really not that different from completing a jigsaw puzzle. Ultimately, it's about cooperation and balance, a common vision. So the next step is to determine how we get there. 
by building sales and marketing teams that work together. At the very basic level, what well-aligned organizations do better than their competition is to allow sales to focus on selling and marketing to support sales. After all, it's said that sales funds marketing. So we want to create highly relevant marketing strategies and tactics. In other words, to nurture each other. In our puzzle example, can you imagine if each team thought the puzzle formed a different picture and they were trying to put together a different outcome using the same pieces? Instead, to achieve alignment, the sales and marketing teams must agree on what the outcome needs to be and then basically to plot a path backwards to achieve that vision. They need to visualize the same results and cooperatively focus on that shared outcome. First, as it said, is you must know thyself. Before you think about the team, you really need to think about each person's role within that team. The team exists only to support the community of those individuals. And so we must consider each person's unique biases and preferences. And there are some tests and projects that can be created in order to identify those individual influences and compliance. Uh, you may be familiar with DISC and Myers-Briggs. These are tests that allow insights into individual communication styles, and it allows us to better form teams that can work together to be successful. Based on our 30 plus years of experience, here are some key to building winning sales and marketing teams. After all, marketers are half artists and half science, and they want hard data to back up stories. And it's interesting because most times salespeople assume that marketing folks don't want to use hard metrics and mathematics, but actually marketers are hungry to use metrics. They just use a different language and they measure things differently. While the salespeople may talk about the bottom line, the marketing folks might talk about gross rating points and open rates, eyeballs and impressions, shares and follows. So it's important for us to establish a common language together so that even if the teams are using different measurements, they can understand how sales funds marketing and marketing helps to generate sales. This will allow the sales to see the value of PR and marketing, which are harder to track and harder to quantify, but we all understand are integral to building brands. The goal is the same. Sales is interested in the bottom line and marketing is interested in click-through rate and conversions. But in the end of the day, everyone wants to keep score and everyone knows what winning looks like. The important thing is for sales and marketing teams to set their targets together for both teams to be accountable to a single leader. Now that leader does not have to be a single person. It can be a group. And it also can be traded off, much like governments trade off leaders with new administrations. And it doesn't have to be a senior level. It can be a junior. The important thing is for the individual to know how to ask important questions for the group, to stimulate discussions that begin with the words, what if, how about, and why not? So step three is to take the next step and get to know each other in these sessions. Salespeople understand the marketplace, the players and the relationships in the channel, and marketers know how to reach those targets once they're clearly identified. But it's not enough to just establish sales and marketing alignment. You've got to build and grow it, much like a plant needs water and nutrient-rich soils. So collaboration is the key. Alignment starts with shared experiences and it builds trust, inspiration, 
support, and it develops into empathy and drives collaboration. So here are some steps that organizations can use to reach alignment. Remember, both teams want more customers, increased brand awareness, and higher profits. They are seeking mutual reward. And it's important with both sales and marketing to understand that this is not just a journey and a destination. It's a marathon rather than a sprint. So we recommend holding monthly meetings with both sales and marketing combined and working together to benchmark the success of the marketing materials. We call them quarterly events, and we actually carve out time once a quarter to focus in on sales and marketing alignment. We recommend that people wear something different as far as clothes and travel a different way so that they can focus in on something different than the day-to-day -day experiences that happened in business to carve out that special time. And this needs to be a joint exercise where everyone participates and everyone's voice is heard. The most important thing is to have a common CRM platform, customer relationship management. Uh, this is how leads are identified and scored. We call it a funnel and we seek middle of the funnel experiences. The funnel starts with the word awareness. In, in fact, it goes awareness, consideration, intent, trial, purchase. Awareness is the first on the top of the funnel. That's the widest shape. And that basically corresponds to, yes, I have heard of you. I am aware of your product and your service. And then as you drive down the funnel, you enter the next phase, which is consideration. After I have heard of you, it's important that I would, now that I'm aware, I would consider purchasing or specifying your product or service. And then as we go down the funnel one step further, we reach probably the most important step, and that is I have intent. After I have become aware, and after I have admitted that I would consider you, it's very important to understand if I have the intent to make a change. If I don't have the job description or responsibility, then I certainly can't have the intent to be able to specify that change or consideration. And so that puts almost a red light or a green light, a go or a no-go to the marketing campaign. Either the person is qualified to have intent or they're not. And so once they have said that within the next 18 months, I intend to do a review, we move down the funnel to trial. Trial is somebody who says, yes, send me a sample. I would like to experience the product or let's work on a project together. If you will, let's date before we get married. Let me understand a little bit more about how your product actually works. Let me touch it and feel it. And then, of course, purchase. That's when the purchase order is submitted, the check is in the mail, and the angels sing. So let's decide, let's define soft and hard measures for discerning a successful marketing piece. After all, they say, if it isn't measured, it didn't happen. And the most important items in sales and marketing are measured. So going back to the restaurant analogy, I, I still enjoy cooking at home. And at home, I cook without a recipe book, a little pinch of this and a little pinch of that. But in the restaurant, everything was measured and weighed because they had to create a consistent user experience. They also had to create efficiency for how the food was prepared and how the inventory was managed. So in the end, they don't want enough innovation in the message. Instead, they want a consistent experience from the restaurant analogy. So similarly in sales and marketing, what we do is 
instead of measuring ingredients or weighing the ingredients, we talk about benchmarking the reporting of the collateral. We rate what is most successful, what is somewhat successful, and then what is not successful at all. And it's important to continue to do this ongoing review of what's working, much like you prune in a garden. They call it taking out the dead wood so that the rest of the plant can focus its energy on nurturing the growth of the flowers. And it's similar in marketing materials. You want to be able to uh, use an 80-20 rule we recommend in order to determine what is working and perhaps what is not working as well. You've probably heard this 80-20 rule in many other types of modeling. Uh, sometimes they say that 20% of the folks are doing 80% of the work. But in this case, what we're talking about is retaining the 80% of marketing that is working and removing or pruning the 20% that's underperforming. Well, of course, you've got to measure everything in order to determine what is working and what is not working so well. And then you replace the 20% that you've pruned out with the answers to those questions that we talked about a few minutes ago. The what if, the how about, and the why not. Those are the incubation and innovation committees who are bringing in new ideas. And it's just as easy to strike out with those new ideas as it is to hit a home run, as they say in baseball. But the idea is you're only risking 20% for that potential reward. In the end, after you've got everything on paper, we recommend throwing all that paper away. And then ultimately getting out into the real world, walking in each other's shoes. For example, in the sessions that we orchestrate, we create exchange students. Those exchange students go from the marketing department and sit in with the sales folks and the sales folks sitting in with the marketing folks so that they can spend time together visiting with the other team and establishing the challenges that they each face. And after they get to know each other in the office, we recommend they actually get together in the car for ride alongs where sales and marketing folks can get what we call windshield time together. This allows them to show up at the architect's offices and create CEU lunch and learns together so that they can hear the questions that the architects ask or to show up at the sales counter of the supply house where the channels of distribution meet up with the contractors and to learn how those counter salespeople overcome objections. So when the marketing folks are creating marketing materials, they have a real world relevance. This also provides a chance to share knowledge in a personal and connected way, and it helps facilitate the transfer of that knowledge. Because as we know, markets, products, and services thrive on innovative, outside-the-box thought. And so cross-team collaboration encourages that innovation and incubation through shared experiences. Back to the restaurant analogy, when I started becoming a waiter, I noticed that the restaurant I worked for had the waiters as the only ones who got the tips. And they assumed management of the operation that the waiters had the most ability to influence the sale because they were the ones face to face at the with the customer in the front of the house or at the table. And this is very similar to how uh, marketing organizations sometimes is run where the salespeople are the only ones who get the commissions. But I learned when I got together at a more progressive restaurant that the tips were pooled and they were shared among the bus people who cleaned the table and the bartenders to make sure that the ice was there and they continue to make drinks for the customer. And through those shared incentives, the process actually created more results for everyone. Now, not everyone uses the same incentives. Usually cash speaks loudest, but there are some people who prefer to get rewarded through recognition. 
in contests and prizes and bonuses, even extra days off. So it's important to learn how each team member is to be rewarded and then to incent them accordingly. When they're recognized for their contributions, team members will be motivated to address challenges and seize opportunities. And this creates forward momentum. Now, very important is to get top-down agreement because as we said, most organizations reward the salespeople with the commissions and they're not readily available to change their model to create new buy-in for this sales and marketing alignment. And you hear things like, well, that's just not the way we do things around here. That's the kind of buy-in that we have to eliminate if we're going to get leaders to be able to evolve with our team. Another hazard that we have to watch out for is the urge to hoard data. They say information is power. And you've heard that a lot of times, but in the case of sales and marketing alignment, we've got to resist the urge for that job security where someone is keeping that data to themselves and not sharing it transparently because that data has to be accessible for both teams. It would be like being in a, in a uh, game of a sport and not being able to see the score along the way. You would never know whether you're winning and learning. So, in this case, it's important to in, incorporate that ongoing review and oversight because it's not a set it and forget it. There's incremental milestones that has to be recalibrated as we go. But most importantly is that that data will continue to provide a dashboard and a scorecard to let you know how you're doing. And then we must not be afraid to adjust course. When we see that the trajectory is changing on the, on the chart, we should be agile, we should be adaptable and know when it's time to take a slight turn to the left or a slight turn to the right. At Cleburne Associates, we understand the importance of sales and marketing alignment. And so I wanted to summarize a couple of the steps and then I want to show you a couple of real world examples um, that, that have actually been used for manufacturers of building products so that you can see how it actually happened in a project profile or a case study. So it's important for us to continually look for opportunities to drive that collaboration to achieve the sales goals with marketing goals. We want to bring sales and marketing teams together by focusing on and creating common ground. And then we must establish clear communication. Now you probably are aware of that game that we played in grade school called telephone, where one person would whisper in the ear of the next person. And they in turn would whisper that message to the next person. And by the time it got around the room, the message had completely changed due to the noise and the bias of the storytellers who communicated the message. So it must be very clear that this is heard. In fact, we recommend a process of three steps where we repeat back to the person when they give us a communication. And it says, I care. I care about the same things that you care about. This is important to me because it's important to you. And I understand sometimes it's important for me to repeat back to you what I just heard. That allows them to be able to say, well, no, you really don't understand. That wasn't what I had meant. Let me say it again. So I care. I understand. And then most importantly, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get back with you at 2.30 by tomorrow afternoon or whatever it is, because if you can't say that you heard it, you understand it and you care about it, you must also be able to say, and here's my action or my next steps. So we want to develop an integrated marketing plan that has buy-in from both the sales and marketing teams. And that way we can create one vision and execute sales and marketing from the same perspective. Once we develop that program, it's important to maintain it because the world continues to evolve, opportunities continue to change. So as I promised, here's a couple of case studies 
Uh, these are recent examples of how we successfully instituted sales and marketing alignment. The first example is from a company that manufactures artisan crafted wide plank wood flooring. The company wanted to expand its national and regional outreach, and they wanted to build brand awareness among its target audiences. Their target audiences were architects, designers, and of course, homeowners to pull through the sale. Marketing came to the table and we were watching this happen in, in real world. And they said, we recommend a national campaign. And they argued, and it was interesting to hear them argue using metrics, because remember the perception was that marketing folks don't wanna use metrics. And instead these team members came and said, after all, a national campaign will provide the lowest cost per thousand and the most eyeballs. And they were trying to use the recommendation of efficiency and return on investment. But sales came to the table and they said, I'm not sure you understand, but we have six regions and six regional sales managers. And each one of those regions and each one of those regional sales managers believes that their region is distinct. There was enough difference between the Southeast and the Northwest and the Central. And each one of those regions celebrated a different color of wood, some lighter, some darker and different decor. And they recommended that there needed to be six campaigns and that not one size could fit them all the way the marketing team came together. And yet the marketing team said that's going to be so expensive to create six campaigns instead of one. So that was how we entered into the opportunity. The first step was to interview the stakeholders from sales, marketing, and even customer service. Because if you think about it, customer service is one of the departments that hears the voice of the customer when they're dealing with questions on installation or warranty claims. So we wanted to get feedback from all of these different departments, all of the landscape that had opinions about the brand, the product, even the competitors, and what was the overall market. We performed a detailed gap analysis. We were looking for areas where sales and marketing teams weren't aligned and when there were room for improvement. We conducted what we called a right start session where we met key members of the sales and marketing team to confirm the goal and objectives and to refine the core messaging. And then we met with the six showroom directors. Remember they said there were six different regions. So we actually traveled to those regions and talked and looked at which products were selling in which region to identify and nurture the relationships with the key designers in each of those regions to understand what the voice of the customer was looking for. And that's where we came upon the insight to create a brand ambassador program so that in each region, a interior designer was appointed for a mutually rewarding relationship. We developed an integrated national and regional PR and content marketing program where these brand ambassadors were able to speak to their own audiences with their own messaging in each of those six regions. And we created a mutually rewarding opportunity where we would share their message on our website and in our marketing material. That gave them an audience that they didn't have immediate access to. And in exchange, they created a very cost efficient opportunity for us to use their third party endorsement in each of the six regions. The idea was to create regional events. For example, in the United States, there is a uh, program called Design Chicago. And when the client wanted to open up a new virtual showroom in Washington, DC, there are events that happen sometimes after hours with trade organization 
the National Kitchen and Bath Association, the National Association of the Remodeling Industry, the National Association of Home Builders. Each of them had a regional chapter in each of the six regions, and they created events where it was hosted in the different showrooms and our ambassadors would come and speak and teach. And that was the way that we created the cost efficiency for the marketing department who said that a national campaign was going to be the most cost efficient. And we nurtured the sales team that said we needed a regional solution to each of the six chapters. The second opportunity is a company that is involved in stainless steel. So we just talked about wood flooring and, and now we're talking about railings and awnings that are used for residential and commercial spaces. And in this case, the company knew that they had a problem with sales and marketing alignment. It didn't take us to tell them that. And they wanted to create a program to create stronger synergy between that marketing and sales team that they had. And it consisted of not only company-owned sales reps, but also independent sales rep teams. The one thing that we had found out from all of the different sales folks is that they felt like the marketing collateral, the brochures, didn't resonate with the nuances of what they were hearing in the marketplace. And, and of course, we found out that the marketing people had not been riding along and talking to the lumber yards and the different voice of the customer. And so it made sense. We understood why those marketing materials weren't resonating. In fact, one during the interview, marketing person said, you're asking us to launch a new product, we haven't even seen this product. You're telling us about it. What would it be like for us to actually touch and feel it? Why don't we get involved with some hands-on demonstration? So we got the marketing team out in the field and did the ride along with the salespeople. They went to the lumber yards and the dealer locations and they talked with customers in that real world setting that we just talked about. We collaborated with the company to develop a comprehensive roadmap for aligned marketing and public relations based on the input from those sales and marketing leadership teams. And remember, we said it was important to meet regularly. So we created those quarterly events where the agency and the team members brainstormed new programs to build awareness for the company's offerings. And this provided an opportunity for everyone to contribute to build that consensus and ownership. We set aside some time for those quarterly events to review and refresh messaging where both the marketing and sales people were creating phrases and keywords to make sure that we were engaging the multiple target audiences. And then the piece de resistance was a national sales meeting where the marketing folks and the sales folks actually participated on installing the new product to be able to get hands-on approaches from the field on how this product actually worked before they created new collateral material. And this hand-on training was inspired from the marketing folks in that first Right Start fo focus session that said, we've never seen this product, we've never touched this product. So ultimately we agreed and said the most important thing for you in order to create relevant marketing material is to get that hands-on demonstration. So after they got the voice of the customer from the field and they actually saw the benefits and the ease of installation, then and only then was the marketing department really qualified to create relevant materials. So these are just a few examples of ways to achieve and to maintain that successful sales and marketing alignment. So I thought we might pause for 10 minutes or so and to ask any questions that you might have or to talk about any kind of opportunities where you too have experienced sales and marketing misalignment and how we might be able to help you overcome some of those objections. Thank you, Steve for this nice presentation. 
And um, I would like to ask Kat to start asking you the questions that we have received from our participants, if it's okay. Of course, thank you. Yeah, no, go on Kat, please, thank you. Okay, sure. So the first question is, with the uncertainty of COVID, how can sales and marketing teams work together if they're unable to meet in person or to do sales ride-alongs? Great question. And of course, all of society has changed as a result of this once in 100 years pandemic. And so we've had to adapt. And, and yes, it's difficult to uh, coordinate people in the same offices and perhaps in the same car. Um, and so that's why we use the same kind of communication tool that we're using here this afternoon, Zoom or Microsoft Teams, and to be as close as possible to in the same room as each other. So while we might not be in the same office or we might not be in the same car, we can still engage with voice and visuals in order to create those kinds of collaborative conversations. All right, we have another question. How do you gain that buy-in that you mentioned for management to encourage and support sales and marketing collaboration? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good one, thank you. So we said that one of the first objections that we get from management is, well, that's just not the way we do things around here. We hear that more often than not. You just don't understand. That's not the way we work. That's not the way it's worked for us in the past. And the way that we create the best traction with management is to say that, why don't you consider that sales funds marketing and to create a percentage so that the marketing is based on a percentage of sales, let's say 5%. And so that as sales grows, that 5% stays constant, but it continues to increase based on the increase of sales. And so that creates the structure that management looks for. They don't think that the whole apple cart is being upset by creating incentives for marketing. Ultimately, what marketing enjoys much like a uh, investment counselor or stockbroker, is they enjoy the ability to see the budget continue to grow and for them to have the authority to be able to make recommendations on how to invest that budget. So it really doesn't change the leadership's impression about the structure for how to fund marketing. Instead, it allows for a connection to the success of sales, much like those pooled tips in the restaurant where they're able to incent the busboys and the bartenders to help turn the tables. It works the same way. And when management understands that and they can consider that it will be an autonomous process, they usually are much more flexible to buy in. Okay, and we have another question. Are there any other teams and an organization between sales and marketing that should be included? And I know you mentioned, Steve, uh, customer service, but are there other teams that should be included in that, in that picture? Yes, uh, customer service, as you mentioned, Kat, is important because they represent the voice of the customer, potentially at, at a very difficult time when someone's calling up, often to complain, often to understand what's involved with the warranty or to get a fix. And so, as, as you mentioned, they are an important uh, subset to bring into sales and marketing. But another group that most people don't consider is product design. So, if a group of uh, people are working on the next product, wouldn't it make sense for them to be involved in the conversation where sales and marketing are understanding the voice of the customer? That way, that innovation committee or that incubation lab that's thinking around the corner, what's next, can be much more relevant associated with that voice of the customer. So while we, the two major players in the conversation are sales and marketing, when we bring in both customer service and product design, we have a really fruitful opportunity to create not only harmony for today, but also important sales opportunity for tomorrow. Right. I believe that's all the questions that we have that I see, unless there are some additional ones. 
um, I guess we don't have any other questions, but if we have any questions in future, uh, you can uh, send us a mail to building catalog and we can uh, send it to Kat or Steve. And I think they will be really, uh, <clears throat> they will appreciate the effort and uh, they will try to answer you by email. Um, so Steve and Kat, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for this really nice presentation, very really nice session, and uh, hope to meet you at another project, another maybe face-to-face -face sometime. And thank you all the participants that uh, because you watched this session and hope to meet you in another construction marketing event. Thank you very much. Thank Have you, nice everyone. Day. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe.